Punks, it's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 222 at block height 632,635. On I don't even know what is this Monday, June 1st. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just say days of the week have uh, not been a mental concern of mine the last few days. Just a regular day, nothing weird happening at all. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I feel like we have to kind of touch on everything going on um, until we get into the news. Like, this is just getting fucking crazy. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know what else to say except something fucked up happened. And now things that are just as fucked up, if not more so, are happening all over the place. And people need to pay attention right now out of any time in your life is the most important time to not just impulsively retweet shit to not just blindly accept something put in front of your face as a fact and react to it because it is absolutely undeniable that somebody out there is intentionally trying to agitate this situation. I have never in my life seen as much false information circulated widely online as I have in the last 48 hours ever from all sides, just purely attempting to incite anger. When, um, I don't even remember the fucking piece of shit's name. But when the cop was fucking arrested who killed George, I, within 30 seconds of seeing that, saw a mugshot where he had a shit-eating grin on his face. And when I went to go find that 30 minutes later to show somebody else, it was completely gone. And the only mugshot circulating had a look on his face of a man who knew his life was fucked. I have seen people take clips of Trump's speeches from months ago where he was making fun of Bloomberg for having to catch his breath during the debates and looking stupid, going, oh, I can't breathe, and have that cut totally out of context and circulated right now as if Trump is discussing the incident with George Floyd. Just this morning, I saw somebody circulating a fake MSNBC news overlay onto footage from World War Z and attempting to convince people that MSNBC actually aired movie footage as if this is a real shot of a city due to these riots. Pay attention and know that every fucking piece of information you amplify, you circulate, is going to have an emotional effect on other people. They are going to react based on what you are circulating. So pay the fuck attention to what you are circulating and whether or not it is true. Because this is not the type of fucking situation to just inflame more anger. That will do nothing but get people hurt, get people killed, and ruin people's lives. And I don't care what you think about anything that is going on right now. That will go nowhere productive. Sorry for the giant rant, Janine, but um, you know, if you, you want to kind of toss anything, floor is open. 
Yeah, um, I mean, everyone saw that it initially started in Minneapolis because that was the city in which the death of George Floyd happened. It has, over a couple of days, now spread to basically every major city in the U.S. And um, one of the things that I was focusing on looking at mostly initially was the reports of a predator drone being flown over Minneapolis, which was quite interesting for a number of reasons. Um, the use of drones in a domestic setting should always be concerning, especially when they're ones that are conventionally used overseas, um, as some journalists like to phrase it, to hunt down terrorists. Um, as I pointed out, that's actually not even the majority of deaths that occur from drones. Uh, those are actually civilians. And the other thing that I've been looking at is um, journalists being either arrested or uh, intimidated or physically abused, just like a bunch of protesters for whatever reason. And obviously there's a lot of those posts going up and people are kind of confused, especially journalists. They have been confused over the past couple of days because you basically have mainstream media journalists getting arrested on live television. And yes, there are calls being made. There are lawyers being paid to uh, rectify some of those situations because they can, but it is still confusing people as to how that is even possible. Well, how is that even happening? How could journalists be arrested when they're doing, when they're not participating? And I've had to point out to people that there is in the first amendment, nothing that actually privileges the press. The, the whole idea of the freedom of the press had nothing to do specifically with a, a privilege given to people who call themselves the press or are licensed as people of the press. The freedom of the press had to do with the use of the printing press, an actual tool, a machine. And there's a lot of journalists, especially mainstream media journalists, who think that because they have a press badge, they are somehow exempt from the behavior of law enforcement that is being directed towards people who are protesting and participating. Whereas journalists say they like, or they like to pretend that by recording events, they are not participating in some way. Um, that is not the case. Press badges are not shields. Press badges are about access control. They're about showing the state who you are and giving them information so that they can make a decision about, for example, whether to let you in to press briefings in government buildings and things like that. Press badges do not protect you. They're about access control. And that privilege, if any privilege exists at all, can be revoked at any time. It's not based in law in even most states. Even the concept of journalist source protection is something that's not part of U.S. federal law. It's not even part of several U.S. states' law. So that's something that a lot of people, whether you're mainstream media, independent media, or a citizen journalist, as they're somewhat pejoratively called, um, you're going to have to worry about this no matter who you are, and your press badge is not going to save you. So the people that are kind of surprised that they're being treated this way. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to be treated this way and you could have always been treated this way and they're deciding not to anymore. So what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this kind of brings up, you know, a door being opened right now. And I see way too many people, way too many people cheering this on. So I'm going to try and disentangle this as clearly as I can. 
Um, you know, Trump is trying to declare Antifa a terrorist organization right now. And they are terrorists. They are people who commit violent acts to enact political change. That is what they are. But that word in the legal sense has way more implications than just acknowledging what they are. It strips them of their rights. It strips them of their guarantee of due process, of all of their constitutional rights and their ability to actually be put through a fair process to result in justice. They become a person the government can do anything to. And despite the fact that, yes, Antifa are fucking terrorists, that is a slippery slope that you cannot walk back up. Because the next presidency, it's going to be libertarians. And the one after that, it's going to be fucking ecologists and fucking the green, whatever the fuck it is, whoever the fuck is in power is going to look at the people that disagree with them and go, you have no rights. And it doesn't matter if somebody engages in violence. It doesn't matter if people destroy shit. If they get out of that situation without immediately losing their life in response to that, then they are entitled to due process. They are entitled to their rights. And if they are not, then we are just sliding down into a state of savagery from civilization. And that should terrify everybody. I mean, the, the biggest problem that I have with that declaration is that one, uh, so far I haven't seen any other instances of a group that is not actually an organization. There is no fish official organization that goes by that name. There's no instance of a you know, re a recognizable and clear group being given this label. The problem is we don't know what, like, there. we don't know whether the people who are making this declaration, who are going to be enforcing this declaration, have the same definition of that group and who is included in that group. So I'm not going to get behind any kind of labeling that is vague and could potentially be used to target people who are not using violence, but simply identify with a particular word that could be vaguely tied to people who are using violence. So the point is like, there is a difference from verbally acknowledging what something is and pushing this kind of legal defining of that. And those are two different things that should be approached and seen two very different ways. <sighs> but yeah. I don't know. Honestly, Janine, I'm kind of in the mood to talk about Bitcoin shit instead of all this. Uh, <laughs> you want to move past it for now? Yeah, just uh, going to say it ahead of time. Please, dear God, no one say Bitcoin fixes this. <laughs> yeah. But on that note, um, there is a really awesome uh, proposal put forward by Bitcoin folk hero Chris Belcher. Um, I legitimately call this um, the biggest breakthrough in Bitcoin privacy since Samurai and Wasabi implemented ZeroLink. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Greg Maxwell invented CoinJoin back in 2013 as a, a protocol proposal for these types of privacy problems. But he also um, developed a protocol called CoinSwap. And the idea is pretty much to create an atomic swap um, between two different Bitcoins rather than different chains or coins. Um, but this has never really been implemented for a, a few different reasons. Um, chiefly amongst them is that previously it wasn't really possible to 
create this kind of construct um, with a wide anonymity set. Um, you effectively had to either do two of two multi-signatures um, or you could use a two of three um, you know, to obscure the fact that this could likely be a coin join when look or not coin swap with other heuristics you're looking at, you know, such as number of transactions in a short time period or things like that, or expose, um, you know, more complex scripts like hash locks um, that kind of give away what's going on here. And so um, it's kind of funny um, now that Schnorr is is pretty much at a point where soon is probably a, a, an actual fork proposal coming. Um, people have done a lot of work on getting the type of interactive um, stuff that Schnorr can do um, working for ECDSA signatures, although it is a little more interactive and uh, complicated. Um, but this presents a solution to coin swap. And the entire brilliance here is that by constructing a effective multi-sig um, that looks like a, a standalone private key or a public key, like a single key pair um, with ECDSA allows you to do things like coin swaps without giving away that that's what's going on. Um, you simply create the chain of pre-signed transactions, um, sign all of those and then load everything. And the series of transactions that result in you interchanging your UTXO with somebody else's have zero script-wise um, fingerprint giving away that this is a coin swap. And he is actually building this out into a whole protocol um, where instead of just direct swaps like that, um, he is actually looking at a protocol where you can chain coin swaps through multiple different participants um, so that the other participants even are not able to see exactly which coins you wound up with in this swap and from where. And you can do some pretty um, complicated stuff with this. Um, you can have one end break down um, completely separate UTXOs and deliver them to multiple addresses rather than one amount. Um, you can condense a single output I'm sorry, expand a single output into a fan of different transactions through multiple people like that. You can also condense um, separate isolated UTXOs that you do not want to tie together on chain and wind up with a single UTXO through this without ever connecting those two original UTXOs on chain. Um, and you know we can even go a step further here. Um, the succinct atomic swap proposal um, that Ruben Thompson recently proposed, um, that type of mechanism um, could be used here to cut one of the necessary transactions um, off of the chain. So for instance, um, you would have the loading transaction and then an interim um, coin swap transaction where it is at the, the multi-sig you generate with the participant. And then there would be another transaction um, putting it completely under your control. Um, you could do a very similar thing to the succinct atomic swap where the counterparty gives you their half of the key that was um, done through ECDSA um, multi-party computation. And then by just watching the chain, um, you can delay for however long you want unless the other party attempts to um, revoke that end of the coin swap, you would need to actually submit it to chain, but break some of the timing analysis um, based on the number of transactions that you go through to do a coin swap like this um, to further obscure the, uh, the connections there. And so, I mean, yeah. The, the types of, of things you can build with this, the degree of privacy that can be achieved, blows past anything any current coin join implementation has achieved. And he is going to actually build this out and create a client for it, similar to join market. Um, he's going to have kind of a, a market-based um, liquidity um, provision mechanism, you know, incentivized with fees. And he even wants to implement the fidelity bond idea that he has been working on for join market for this as well. So, I mean, this is a really fucking amazing breakthrough um, in terms of protocol design. And when this is actually released in software, um, this is very similar to pay join. Um, 
a regular transaction could just as easily be one of these, um, whether a person is using software or not. And it breaks heuristics that chain analysis companies use, whether you are using this tool yourself or not. So yeah, this is big. And this is doable right now without any kind of fork or upgrade required to Bitcoin. So like point blank, <laughs> I mean, you still have to cover the rough edges on things, but I'm not seeing long-term privacy problems with Bitcoin anymore, as long as this comes to fruition. Um, I think that is a close to solved issue. Yeah, and no, definitely, um, I believe, I don't know if he included it in the post itself, but obviously Chris Belker is taking donations for the work he does. So definitely do that because this will further uh, the implementation process a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, so who's up next? I think uh, that's a you. Somebody going backwards where we're going forwards. Yeah, uh, so in the last two episodes, uh, 220 and 221, um, I've mentioned some studies that analyzed how private or anonymous some altcoins are, like Monero and Zcash, particularly Zcash. Um, and recently I was talking to someone about how it was suspected for a long time that Ethereum's account-based design rather than the UTXO-based design, like with Bitcoin uh, and many others, uh, would have a negative impact on its ability to be used anonymously. And it turned out that within a day of me saying that, uh, there was a new study published on this very topic. Um, the title of the study is Blockchain is Watching You, Profiling and De-Anonymizing Ethereum Users. Uh, it was made by researchers from three Hungarian universities and a former mathematics and statistics student at the University of Toronto who now identifies as being part of a company called Hashcloak Inc., which I cannot find any information on. Uh, you may know her, though, as uh, at bad crypto bitch on Twitter because uh, she actually quit school in 2018 after Vitalik sent her $100,000 worth of Ether just because she tweeted at him. So let's see how she pays that back. Uh, at the start of the study, they write that until today, there were no similar studies on account-based cryptocurrency privacy provisions. Therefore, in this work, we put forth the problem of studying the privacy guarantees of Ethereum's account-based model. Assessing and understanding the privacy guarantees of cryptocurrencies is essential, as the lack of financial privacy is detrimental to most cryptocurrency use cases. Furthermore, there are state-sponsored companies and other entities, ergo chain analysis, chain analysis always messed that up, uh, performing large-scale de-anonymization tasks, um, on cryptocurrency users. In contrast to the UTXO model, many cryptocurrencies apply the account model. In an account-based cryptocurrency, users store their assets not in UTXOs, but in accounts. Already in the Bitcoin white paper, um, Nakamoto suggested that a new key, new key pair should be used for each transaction to keep them from being linked to a common owner. Despite this suggestion, account-based cryptocurrency users tend to use only a handful of addresses for their activities. Uh, and the account-based model reinforces address reuse on the protocol level. So this behavior practically makes the account-based cryptocurrencies inferior to UTXO-based currencies from a privacy point of view. Um, now, unfortunately, with everything happening, uh, I was way too busy to study the paper in depth. But uh, I can tell that it's very technically detailed. Um, one of the things they looked at is Tornado Cash, which is a non-custodial ZK snark based mixer that was launched in December 2019 and is touted for uh, is touted as a way for Ethereum users to improve their anonymity. Um, what I did see is that they came to the conclusion that due to some some user behavior uh, points such as how long users tended to leave their ether in the mixer. Um, they were able to kind of time, uh, you know, when uh, funds are likely to enter and then leave. And so that makes them easier to de-anonymize despite using the mixer. Um, some things they did not look at were network level privacy, wallet and browser privacy. Um, 
and a few other things, but they seem to want to explore them in the future, and I think that is going to be rife with interesting data about how uh, privacy is probably not so great here. But yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out because this is one of the first studies I've seen that um, looks at these issues for Ethereum. Yeah. Um... Real big shocker that when you just have one thing with your balance tied to it, that it's really hard to keep that private. Big shock. Also, there's one other thing. I saw a tweet from... I can't remember his name, so I'm going to go look for it. So, brief break. One second. Do, 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 do. Okay, so I found it. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, not being an Ethereum thing, but a Zcash thing in the uh, general discussion about there being not as much anonymity as people say, um, <laughs> Ian Myers, um, I can't remember if he is at uh, the Electric Coin Company or the Electric Coin Foundation, i.e. the Zcash. I don't even know if the Zcash Foundation is still the Zcash Foundation, but anyway, I'll just call it Zcash Company and Zcash Foundation because that's less confusing. Um, I don't remember which one he is at, but I know that Ian Myers is one of the developers of Zcash, and apparently on May 30th, he tweeted, someone should build Zcash Private, a wallet with a cool cyberpunk scheme that only supports shielded transactions and uses Tor. And yes, this was arguably quite hilarious because you'd think that this is something that you wouldn't just be suggesting to do on Twitter. It would be something that you have either already done or is a high priority for you, given that you are a privacy coin. But I guess no, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. What if somebody just writes a wallet for Zcash that like makes Zcash work the way it was supposed to? Come on, somebody. Amazing. Please? Please? Yeah, this is, I mean, it's, it's, it, this, it just goes to show it's this simple. Like, I really cannot think of maybe more than one or two things privacy wise in this space that there is some coin built around. Um, like it all came from Bitcoin. It was all shit developed by Bitcoin developers for Bitcoin that they just ran off and implemented prematurely, inefficiently, and then went, look at what we did. And um, yeah, they all keep getting broken. You know what I think that they're going to suggest next, Shinobi? I bet they're going to suggest that maybe making Zcash its own coin was not the best move, and that maybe they should turn the technology of Zcash into a second layer on Bitcoin, because who would have thought of that? Mm. Full I'm circle. I'm not taking that, but... <laughs> well, so the joke is that was originally how Zcash was supposed to be, and then they decided to make their own coin instead. So... Mm -hmm. I'm still not taking that, but though, because it's probably going to happen. <laughs> Alrighty though. Wanna take us into the next one? Yeah, scrolly scrolly. Um so the other thing, which is not bad news, is that about one week ago, Casa Hoddle announced that the venture capital fund called Mantis, which is described as an early tech early stage technology investment firm supporting innovative companies across consumer and financial technology. Uh, has apparently decided to invest, uh, become one of the investors of Casa Hoddle. Um, the interesting thing about them is that this venture fund was created by the Chain Smokers, which I did not know who they were before this announcement. But the Chain Smokers are uh, a um, Alex Pal and Drew Taggart, and they are American electronic dj artists so 
that's pretty interesting uh, move because we've seen in the past that artists have taken interest in cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them have uh, gone down the road of let's put our music on the blockchain or something like that. But um, hopefully these guys have uh, wizened up from <laughs> those years and decided, hey, let's just explore the idea of using Bitcoin as a way maybe for independent artists to get paid over the internet for their music in a way where they don't have to rely on record labels and big, huge, annoying payment processing networks. Um, that's where I hope they're going. Um, but then, of course, they didn't say anything. That's just what I'm thinking. But um, in the announcement, uh, CASA's CEO is quoted as saying, in the month following Mantis, the Mantis investment, the team has already provided valuable insights on a variety of subjects, including educating a mass consumer audience about Bitcoin. We're looking forward to our ongoing partnership with Mantis to make sure to make secure Bitcoin self-custody accessible for individuals and families around the world. Yeah, th this is actually really good news, I think. I mean, in the long term, like the generational long term, um, I think things like Casa are just going to die because you have hardware wallets right now you can buy to run things like that yourself. But, you know, that's the difference between generational churn and what is going to make people comfortable enough to come into this space right now. And I think that the niche Casa has is, is perfect because it is that thing that can hold somebody's hand. You can give them a little bit of a safety net, but it's not just that person putting their money entirely in your control. And I will take people stampeding into Casa um, over something like Coinbase 10 days out of the week. Yeah, because the difference, obviously, between Casa and Coinbase is that Coinbase has no incentive to teach you about self-custody, whereas Casa, they can teach you about how to do self-custody, but it doesn't have to be full self-custody. Obviously, they're doing you know services related to talking to high net worth individuals and probably doing, you know, recommendations about what software to use and um i assume at some point if they're not doing this already they're going well they are um but obviously their part of their service is that they can be one of the keys in a multi-signature scheme um so that you're not you don't have to be entirely responsible if you don't want to for your own keys which again i don't remember which episode we mentioned this in but um i think that's going to be increasingly valuable because you're going to have tons and tons of people who don't feel comfortable enough to completely have control over their Bitcoin, but they also don't want to surrender all of their control to something like an exchange because that's no different than the current system and in many ways is actually worse. So I feel like there's going to be a lot more of services like this that serve as a middle ground where they, you know, do work to help you understand the technology and they possibly offer assistance in terms of being a key in a multi signature scheme that you may want to run for yourself or your family or your organization, whatever it is. So I feel like we're probably at least a couple decades off from that being an obsolete uh service mm -hmm. all right so are we ready for a confusing left field out of nowhere thing that contradicts um things we've been saying on a topic for months now uh <laughs> that happens often yeah uh so <laughs> Um, we've been covering the ongoing Bitmain civil war, uh, for months now, uh, with McCree Zan and Jihan Wu, the, the two founders, um, and main shareholders pretty much fighting over control of the company. Um, and you know, at the last time we brought this up, um, was covering the fact that a brawl broke out 
um, in a communist party uh, bureaucratic building um, between McCree's Ann and other Bitmain employees when McCree went there to get copies of documentation showing he was the legal representative of um, the company. Well, um, <laughs> Samson Mao tweeted, I think three days now ago, um, a screenshot of two releases in Chinese um, that he is describing, and I see no reason to doubt him, um, that Bitmain issued a statement from their board of directors um, that they removed McCreezan from all corporate roles last year. And that if he continues to interfere with company business, they will take legal action against him. And so, frankly, um, as an American looking at this with little snippets popping up here and there that I effectively have to count on and trust, uh, you know, Chinese sources on um, at this point, I have no fucking clue what the fuck is going on. Um because if this is a legitimate statement from their board of directors, this contradicts pretty much all of the information I've been seeing and covering here on the show. So, yeah, I mean, I literally just have no clue what the fuck is going on there at this point. Like everything I have seen prior to this was painting Jihan's actions, asserting control over the company as the one acting illegally or without legal authority. And now this statement seems to completely flip that entire narrative on its head. And frankly, I, I don't know what the hell to do um, to, to ascertain anything more clearly about this because that is a country halfway around the world and I don't speak Mandarin. I have even less of an idea of what the hell to do. So, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else to say here. Um, yeah, <laughs> who knows what's going on. Um, hopefully, we will get more concrete information and a better idea soon. Or uh, maybe we'll get another narrative flip like this. Who knows? Alrighty. Ready for something interesting? Yeah, because this has been boring so far. <laughs> Nothing happened here. So, um couple episodes i actually think it was the the season finale of the last season um episode 210 where we talked about um brian bishop creating a beta implementation of a, a bitcoin covenant vault um that purely used pre-signed transactions well um, a research paper that um, brian as well as bob McElrath um and two other people um kind of spread between um, King's College in London and the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, um, have specified very in-depth in architecture to apply that um, vault design in the context of, you know, pr pretty much professional businesses. Um, and they kind of do a quick TLDR. Um, the entire idea was pretty much to lock... Um, coins in a, in a vault, um, which is just pre-signed transactions. Um, and so what you would do is craft these pre-signed transactions, loading the vault, and then you would sign um, transactions ahead of time that either with a time lock, send that money to a predefined hot wallet, or without a time lock would instantly send those coins into a deep cold storage wallet that is kept completely offline. And then once all of these are signed and you actually load the vault, um, you delete the private keys um, used to, to sign those vault transactions, removing it either to a hot wallet or to the deep cold storage so that those pre-signed transactions are literally the only way to move those coins. And the idea is that you can rate limit um, what's going into a hot wallet um, and always with every withdrawal to that hot wallet that is time locked have the option to instantly dump them back into a cold storage wallet if it was an unauthorized withdrawal. And so th they pretty much specced out an entire architecture 
to have separate isolated hardware modules for um, the actual hot wallet, um, the wallet that generates the vault transactions, um, and then the wallet that sits completely air gapped in cold storage. Um, with a central um, computing device that coordinates between all of these, as well as the watchtowers necessary um, to shove things into deep cold storage if an unauthorized withdrawal happens. Um, and pretty much spec this out so that everything is using multisig. And one of the, the core um, you know, changes here I wanted to bring up is the, the vault wallet that is actually signing the pre-signed transactions and then deleting the keys. Um, in a professional setting, what they've kind of done in making that a multi-sig is um, created kind of a, a failure threshold where if you were just using a single key, um, that single key not being deleted securely or not just, just being compromised um, would undermine the entire vault. But using an um, N of N multi-sig for that, that vault um, construction, just a single one of those devices, multiple devices spread geographically, physically secured, would need to successfully delete a key to render the vault safe and uncompromisable. And so, you know, really it's, you know, if you, if you really want to dive through this, I mean, the, the, the entire research paper is in the show notes, but this is pretty much taken um, Brian's vault design and spec this out to be pretty much the type of, of system that a major financial company could actually use and have a, a good balance of safety, um, security, and ability to recover from different threat models. And honestly, um, this being implemented over the coming years is going to be a major, major maturity event for the security of custodial businesses in this space. Um, you know, we see hacks every year um, and there's not really much you can do about it once it hits the chain and it's confirmed. This entire architecture is something that allows those major custodial businesses to limit everything exposed to a hot wallet um, have a very tightly controlled way to refill that hot wallet, and then also have the ability to dump um, anything going into that hot wallet, alternatively into a deep cold storage systems. If let's say hypothetically a hot wallet was compromised and people were also able to compromise um, your kind of middle ground cold storage and try to dump more into the hot wallet to steal. <clears throat> and so like th this architecture, is going to be a huge, huge thing for custodial businesses in this space and a major security improvement um, from how a lot of them are operating right now. Wee! Alrighty. Shit talking time? It's always shit talking time. <laughs> so, um, I recently saw, um, a major trader in this space, I'm not going to call them by name, um, retweet um, and endorse a hardware wallet called Engrave. Um, now, it seems to be something that's been around for the last two years. Um, but Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> I take one look at this, this page um, I, I, I literally had to dig around for five minutes to find a single bit of information on the actual hardware. Um, and it's just a, an STM chip. Um, it's just a, an MCU, just like in the Trezor and in, in the Ledger, all of this shit. But the page is just marketing material, marketing material. Like here, the, the most secure wallet, Engrave offers the most secure solution on the planet. Truly the coldest of wallets built in partnership with world leaders in nanotechnology and hardware security. Ooh. What the flying fuck does nanotechnology have to do with secure processing devices? What the fuck does that have? That, that is 
nonsense. Nano, and, nano. And this is exactly the type of shit that me and Chris were talking about in the, the last episode we did, the orphan block. There is going to be a tsunami of scammy, insecure shit like this being way oversold in terms of their security, if not just being total outright scams. And this is really that that's either just going to happen and lead to a lot of people losing money or, um, you know, people need to call this shit out. Like people who have lots of followers on Twitter, when somebody approaches and offers to pay you money to fucking retweet something or show their product or encourages you to through other reasons, tell them get fucked. Recommend something that you actually looked into, researched, used yourself, that you have skin in the game with. But like the, the, there is going to be no end to this type of shit when we really start moving into a bull market again and you know if if anything is going to to stop or limit the amount of people who get fucked by this it's going to be people being vocal about it and yeah <laughs> fucking nanotechnology get the fuck out of here not sure if that's better or worse than military grade encryption um, I just say worse in, in terms of the level of absurdity. All right. Um, so I think we have an update on something that you have been poking around trying to get clear answers on for quite a while now. Yeah. Uh, sometime on May 26th, 26th or 27th. Um, I'm not sure because um, so many stupid social media sites don't actually put dates or times they just say this was posted an hour ago great that's very informative for the archivist and all of us um but basically on the 26th or 27th uh david vincent Setti, one of the co-founders of hacking team posted on their linkedin page uh which still somehow had four and a half thousand followers to say hacking team is dead definitely dead I am not going to elaborate on that. I'm not going to answer any inquiry about that. I do not use LinkedIn anymore, period. I'm sure that that will be made into a poem someday. It was written in a kind of poem format. But um, so from my perspective, uh, if hacking team really is dead, then that is definitely a great sign because there's a bunch of people who have been waiting for this for years, uh, some for decades, if you're one of the security researchers who were looking into them back in the 2000s uh, when they started up. Um, and especially the security researchers who've had to deal with their malware for a decade or more. And this has been rather a slow death, but it may be a death nonetheless. Uh, the problem is I wouldn't say that we should stop being vigilant about them because even though the company or its leader is uh, claiming to be economically dead, the people involved are still obviously alive and attempting to splinter off into new companies and new ventures. Uh, the one example most of you are probably familiar with is Neutrino of Delete Coinbase notoriety, in part due to yours truly, but that is not the only one. Um, as I summarized on Twitter, Eric Rabe, who did marketing and communications for Hacking Team, went to Gray Heron Technologies in the UK. Russo, Valeri, and Ornagi um, went off with at least $13.5 million from Coinbase's acquisition of Neutrino. The last of hacking team proper was acquired by Memento Labs in Italy, which is reported do, por, reportedly doing poorly, uh, but is still running as far as we know at the moment. Also, it was pointed out by Malware Hunter team on Twitter that the malware that is uh, tagged as being a creation of hacking team um, may still be out there in use, whether officially or in slightly edited copies. And so we should still be continued to be watchful for that going forward. But yes, otherwise it is quite funny and also a relief that, um, you know, the guy that we were told uh, in 2016, I believe, uh, in an article of foreign policy, to uh, fear 
and was painted with a <laughs> very, very scary picture on the cover of the article, um, he is now declaring his company dead. Yeah, that gets rid of all the shady things that you've done in the past, shitbag. Just undoes all of it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I mean, th th that's like saying like the the terrorist organization I is dead. Um, okay, well, are you sure you didn't start a new one? Because that's usually how that goes. Hacking team is dead. Long live hacking team. Mm hmm. Well, you know, nowhere is bad as their acquisition of Hacking Team, but um, you know, Coinbase um is doing other things that I really don't like. So again, <laughs> yeah, uh, Coinbase is acquiring uh, Tagomi Systems, um, a brokerage firm in this space. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, talked about it probably more than a year ago at this point on the show. It is a brokerage firm um, that Peter Thiel was actually one of the investors in. And the entire idea of this um, is pretty much Tagomi will just plug into all of the order books and liquidity pools of all the exchanges they possibly can. Oh, and no, then thank you. <laughs> they will take your order and spread that out across all of the liquidity pools they have access to. Um, to try and prevent uh, market slippage, you know, so you don't go by just at one place and wind up paying way more as you eat through the order book. Um, and this is generally how mature markets work. Um, if you have big, massive liquidity pools for things, um, these types of brokerages pop up for that exact reason. It's just a natural market dynamic. Um, I don't like the fact that you have Coinbase, which is themselves one of those massive liquidity pools, um, acquiring a firm like this. Um, yeah, I just I really think that there is definitely going to be um, changes here that tend to favor Coinbase's um, order books and liquidity pools as far as things being fulfilled through Tagomi. But I just I do not like what Coinbase is doing. Like they are literally um, going down the same route that Google did, um, trying to be the Google of this space, which is just buy up everything. Anything that's doing something different that you're not doing, just buy them. Um, and yeah, I do not want to see that type of conglomeration of this ecosystem because that is a really big attack point until we get to the point that Bitcoin is just freely circulating to a massive degree for goods and services and not channeling through fiat marketplaces, um, that is a very dangerous attack point. And Coinbase seems to be doing everything in their power to become the biggest attack point that they possibly can. And that's just, it might be good in the short term or even long term for Coinbase. I don't think that will be good for Bitcoin overall. Don't be evil unless you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. All right. So who's up next? You? Me, me. All right. Yes. So this is not a Bitcoin story, but considering that it involves a company that many Bitcoiners use and also may impact any future ventures into social media companies that Bitcoiners may use, this may be important. So you may have seen a few days ago that even with everything going on, Orange Man was very, very angry about the fact that Twitter made the decision to hide one of his tweets in a thread from immediate view, though you could still click on the warning message and see the full tweet. In fact, if you archive the tweet, you wouldn't even see the warning message at all, and it would just like a normal look like a normal tweet that had been archived. So it was not deleted, it was not edited to remove certain words, it just had a warning placed over it that you had to click through. And Orange Man responded by drafting an executive order that would remove Section 230, Protection for Private Blocking and Screening of Offensive Material, which falls under U.S. Code Title 47 regarding uh, common carrier regulations. 
Now, I have seen many non-lawyer opinions on whether Twitter's decision or Facebook's opposite decision, which is apparently causing um, some problems in uh, Facebook employee ranks uh, regarding these tweets, were justified or correct or mishandled or whatever. But uh, And I don't necessarily have uh, an opinion at this point either way on you know the ethics of it, whether it made sense. But I feel like the people who are most likely to have an accurate legal understanding of this particular issue is probably the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And since they published a blog post analyzing the legal feasibility and consequences of this action, I will be quoting excerpts from them because they seemed uh, pretty valuable. And this will take a long time and there will be a scroll break. So bear with me. Um, So they start, the main thrust of the order is to attack Section 230, the law that underlies the structure of our modern internet and allows online services to host diverse forms of user speech. These platforms are currently the primary way that the majority of people express themselves online. To ensure that companies remain able to let people express themselves online, Section 230 grants online intermediaries broad immunity from liability arising from publishing another speech. It contains two separate and and independent protections. Subsection C1 shields from liability all traditional publication decisions related to content created by others, including editing and decisions to publish or not publish. It protects online platforms from liability for hosting user-generated content that others claim is unlawful. For example, if Alice has a blog on WordPress and Bob accuses Clyde of having said something terrible in the blog's comments, Section 230C1 ensures that neither Alice nor WordPress are liable for Bob's comments about Clyde. The subsection would also protect Alice and WordPress from claims um, from Bob for Clyde's comment, even if Alice removed Bob's comment. Subsection C2 is an additional and independent protection from legal challenges brought by users when platforms decide to edit or to not publish material they deem to be obscene or otherwise objectionable. Unlike C1, C2 requires that the decision be made in good faith. In the context of the above example, C2 would protect Alice and WordPress when Alice decides to remove a term which the comment from Clyde, uh, or remove a term within the comment from Clyde that she considers to be offensive. Clyde cannot successfully sue Alice for that editorial action as long as Alice acted in good faith. The legal protections in subsection C1 and C2 are completely independent of one another. There is no basis in the language of section 230 to qualify C1's immunity on platforms obtaining immunity under C2. And courts, including the U.S. Court of Appeals and the Ninth Circuit, have correctly interpreted the provisions as distinct and independent liability shields. Brief break to scroll. All right, continued. So, should the order result in FCC rules interpreting 230 that way, a platform's single act, uh, interpreting that way as in interpreting it in the way that the executive order wants you to, a platform's single act of editing user content that the government doesn't like could result in losing both kinds of protections under 230. This essentially will work as a trigger to remove Section 230's protections entirely from a host of anything that someone disagrees with, but the impact of that trigger could be much broader than simply being liable for the moderation activities purportedly done in bad faith. Once a platform was deemed not in good faith, it could lose C1 immunity for all user-generated content, not just triggering, um, not just the triggering content. This could result in platforms being subjected to a torrent of private litigation for thousands of completely unrelated publication decisions. Taking a step back, the order purports to give the executive branch and federal agencies powerful leverage to force platforms to publish what the government wants them to publish on pain of losing uh, Section 230's protections. But if Section 230 permitted this, and it doesn't, the First Amendment bars intrusions on editorial and curatorial, curatorial freedom. Courts have consistently applied this rule to social media platforms, including the Ninth Circuit's recent decision in Prager University versus Google. 
and a decision yesterday by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, (laughs) I am losing my uh, tongue, in a case brought by uh, Freedom Watch and Laura Loomer against Google. In another case, a court ruled that when online platforms select and arrange others' materials and add the all-important ordering that causes some materials to be displayed first and others last, they are engaging in fully protected First Amendment expression, the presentation of an edited compilation of speech generated by other persons. In Manhattan Community Access versus Halleck, uh, the Supreme Court went on to note that Benjamin Franklin did not have to operate his newspaper as a stagecoach with seats for everyone, using that as an analogy, and that the Constitution does not disable private property owners and private lessees from exercising editorial discretion over speech and speakers on their property. But even if the First Amendment were not implicated, the president cannot use an order to rewrite an act of Congress. In passing 230, Congress did not grant the executive the ability to make rules for how the law should be interpreted or implemented. The order cannot abrogate power to the president that Congress has not given. We should see this order in light of what prompted it, the president's personal disagreement with Twitter's decision to curate his own tweets. And that is the end of what I'm quoting from their blog post. So um, the last thing I want to say on this is that, again, I don't know... I haven't made a decision whether it made ethical sense um, for Twitter or Facebook to do what they did. I think the arguments from both were interesting, and I wouldn't say that I disagree with them on their face. And excuse me for a moment, the cat is stealing my chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a tough issue. Because, I mean, it's like, how do you want to come at this from a purely ethical point of view? Um, It's their server. It's their property. But at the same time, there are restrictions that are unevenly applied here where these types of companies get to editorialize anything they want on their platforms seemingly without consequence but if i were to say broadcast or or stream my own content purely myself distribute that myself i am held to all of these restrictions and liabilities that these major companies are not and that just does not seem right why Should I be held if I was to create my own infrastructure, my own tools to distribute my own content? um, You know, that liability is not going to be treated the same. Like, it's it's like the ethics aside, they are distorting the flow of information selectively. And that has serious social consequences. And I am just as nervous about this direction as I am with the attempt to classify Antifa legally as a terrorist group. Because where does this go? And it's it's just like at this point, like I do not understand why these social media companies are not just shifting all of the filter controls to the user and just leave it at that because this is this is moving in a very bad direction because of how both sides here are acting how these companies are acting in terms of editorializing and distorting information on their platforms and how our government is reacting in the steps that it's taking to to get them to stop doing that and that this is not going in a good direction yeah, so the the only last thing that I really wanted to say is that when I first um, saw this decision and saw this action on Twitter, I actually thought it would be far more interesting 
if Orange Man were to challenge the decision by Twitter to alter the presentation of his content based on the fact that currently under their terms of service, Twitter makes an exception to their threatening slash glorifying violence rule for people who are in the military and government. I assume they mean like it wouldn't just be like yeah, like officials the, making officially yes. sanctioned statements. Yes. So if you are part of the military, if you are a military organization or government, then you are under Twitter's terms of service allowed to threaten and glorify violence. That is an explicit exception that they make in their terms of service. Now, I hate that exception. Um, well, no, I like the exception because it exposes the fact very clearly that we make exceptions for the government doing things that we would otherwise like if we were to do then they would be considered illegal or offensive or uh bad when government does it they get this you know immunity which is going to be a very interesting you know the topic of uh immunity in the next couple of weeks um but i if i would love to see a challenge to that um to that exception, because I would love that exception to no longer apply. So I would find that a much more interesting discussion because technically, um, if Twitter is saying that they did this action because the tweet represented a glorification of violence, well, unfortunately, as the president, Orange Man is allowed to do that um, due to that exception. And uh, so what should happen then? is that they either have to change their terms of service to get rid of that exception, or unfortunately, they have to let it go through. And I personally don't like that exception. I would prefer that governments in the military are not allowed to glorify and threaten violence through social media. Of course, the problem is, does Trump actually want to challenge that rule if it affects his ability to do that? Tough question. I think the more important thing is just the distortion of information flow and that nobody should be allowed to do that except the person looking at it who wants to do that because they don't want to see something or they don't want to engage with something. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of jump to the next story, Janine. It's uh, kind of related, but mm -hmm. you know, this is why. I do not like the direction this is going. Um, Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus VR, had every single comment he has ever made on YouTube mentioning the word Wumao, which it translates to 50 cent. It is a term for Chinese propagandists who operate online has been removed from YouTube. And it's not just him. This is a new global filter. Go try it yourself. Go enter that phrase or those kanji characters and watch how fast it is deleted from YouTube. And they are completely stripping any mention of Chinese military propaganda, which is objectively factually existent being circulated on their platform everybody does this israel has their own unit for this america has their own units for this russia everybody does this and they are specifically globally filtering any kind of calling out of china's division to do this this is so far beyond ethics or freedom of speech or property rights. This is destroying the distribution of information that is necessary for a cohesive society and selectively manipulating it. And frankly, at this point, I'm starting to not care if it is private entities or governments who do this, it is the same end result. It is a chipping away at and a destruction of the cohesiveness of society. And that is fucking 
dangerous. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I noticed that. Uh, so I cut out a highlight from one of the episodes where we were talking about the comments that Balaji had made about wanting to use NSA surveillance data for. Uh, I'm going to blurp out this word because apparently YouTube, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of videos now on YouTube that they're not talking about anything to do specifically with the virus. They're not telling people what to do in response to the virus. They're just mentioning the fact that, hey, this is going on and let's chill and do something fun. But if they even use certain keywords related to the virus, they can apparently get... Um, less monetization or even demonetization uh for mentioning those words which see i i don't know if that's true because i'm not a youtube creator but some of them are claiming that's why they're censoring themselves with certain words um we i mean obviously our channel is not monetized so we don't know whether our mentions of it affect us at all it might affect um the surfacing of our content on youtube but uh, we did get one of those um, little bars banners. at the bottom, banners at the bottom of the video where we talked about the uh, normalization of surveillance. So that's fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, just I'm I'm gonna just pull in the, the next story into this too because again, I I'm gonna kind of loosely relate this. Um, you know, th this is kind of an old story from early April, and I'm just bringing this up because I still think this is important. Um, as of April 16th, the IMF had half of the nations of this world ask for emergency funding and bailouts to be able to get through the economic consequences of everybody locking down and it's just like <laughs> look at the dominoes falling oh like right now what is going on in america small businesses were already fucked some companies were already fucked they they were not allowed to open to conduct business the ones that were except for things that you cannot not go to we're seeing reduced business and now things are just being burned to the ground this is not the time to distort information this is not the time to stifle conversation because if you want dialogue to happen people need to be able to communicate with each other and if dialogue doesn't happen all of these things are going to keep compounding and keep getting people angrier and more prone to lashing out. And when that hits a fever pitch that goes too far, there is no winding it back. There is no undoing it. And we'll be locked in a direction I don't think most people in, in this country, in this world, want to go because they're normal, sane people. You know, like all, all of these companies just stop the filtering stop the bullshit and expose it to the users in your user interface let them do it if they want to but like this is getting dangerous this is getting very dangerous and this is not the time to play f fact checker to play moral policing in people's opinions let them engage with each other if they want to instead of devolving to the kind of shit that's going on right now. Well, uh, as a person who does a lot of fact checking, I wouldn't ever recommend that fact checking be stopped, but probably it's, it's not it what would I be, meant. you know, yes, like I, an authority, I, but yes, but in case anyone misinterprets that it would be better if people who were engaging in fact checking would engage in fact checking at the same level as the person they're fact checking to not assume that they necessarily have the correct or perfect answer and exactly yes oh man speaking of uh getting involved in people's business yeah so 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just burn through these two um, real quick. But two um, big privacy issues, um, although they are very different in terms of the, the privacy that was violated. Um, so Binance, apparently, um, for an unknown amount of time um, during 2019, um, allowed any API user um, to watch the orders of other users on their perpetual swap contracts unfiltered through the API. Um, so they're, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to put it this simple. Um, anybody who doesn't think that there was somebody or someone's using this API to front run and react to other people's orders as they came in in real time is high on crack. Um, this is the type of, of exposure that, yeah, anybody who is aware of this could have been front running and trading with asymmetrical information versus people not exploiting this. Um, and we have really no idea how long that was going on. Um, so, yeah. And then um, real quick, uh, before we move along to the next one, um, a similar thing occurred with MetaNet. Um, for those who aren't aware, um, it is the delusional Bitcoin SV put the entire internet on the blockchain um, thing. And yeah, um, Painted Frog on Twitter literally just found um, through a publicly accessible um folder in their system um, were high res qualities of everybody's passports, driver license um, that had been scanned um, to be a member of MetaNet. So yeah, oh, that's goody. a fun one. And then um, you want to take us into the next one, Jeannie? Yeah. So three weeks ago in episode 219, we talked about uh, Zoom's spicy and confusing acquisition of Keybase. And well, let's just say that uh, not much has changed for the better since then, because in a Reuters article from May 30th, it was reported that Zoom plans to strengthen encryption of video calls hosted by paying clients and institutions such as schools, but not by users of its free consumer accounts, a company official said on Friday. The company whose business has boomed with the coronavirus pandemic discussed the move on a call with civil liberties groups and child sex abuse fighters on Thursday, and Zoom security consultant Alex Stamos, who is of uh, Facebook notoriety, confirmed it on Friday. In an interview, Stamos said that the plan was to sub uh, the plan was subject to change, and it was not clear yet which, if any, nonprofits or other users, such as political dissidents, might qualify for accounts allowing more secure video meetings. He said that a combination of technological safety and business factors went into the plan, which drew mixed reactions from privacy advocates. Safety experts, what the hell is a safety expert, who knows, and law enforcement have warned that sexual predators and other criminals are increasingly using encrypted communications to avoid detection. Uh, yes, that's partly because... Um, everyone is increasingly using encrypted communications to, you know, for a variety, a variety of reasons. Um, but let's not talk about that and talk about all the benefits of using uh, encrypted communications. I'm sure those, were, those will not come in handy next couple of days while uh, all of the writing is going on. And so, yeah, this kind of language does not surprise me because I expected nothing smarter from any of these people. Um, including apparently someone from the ACLU who was saying that, yeah, it makes sense to not allow free user accounts to have encryption. Bizarre. Um, prior to this article being published, I saw someone from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Jenny Gebhardt, tweet uh, you heard that right, activists, journalists, organizers, and cash-strapped nonprofits of the world. Zoom could offer you best practice security, but it won't because you might be a child pornographer. Better luck next time. 
I'd be a little less disappointed if Zoom just called this what it is, an upsell. Zoom wants you to pay for an enterprise product. It will pack said product with features to entice you to do so. That's Zoom's prerogative and could be a starting point for more discussion. But spinning it as bad things happen on free accounts strikes me as a paternalistic and unconcerned strikes me as paternalistic and unconcerned about other user groups who need in, uh, end-to-end encryption protection. I also wonder if it's conflating paid free uh, patterns with registered, unregistered ones. I'd be interested to see more numbers. Uh, basically saying that, you know, you can be a registered user who is using the service for free, and you could also be an unregistered user who's using it for free. And so if maybe Zoom moves to a model where you're registered, they at least get more information about you on a consistent basis if you are using Zoom for questionable activities. Um, again, she ends the thread by saying, I've heard no concrete plans to make this clear to the average user. Um, Prophecy foretells Zoom now offers end-to-end -end encryption headlines and confused people with a false sense of security about a platform that had and some great work to earn their trust. I sincerely hope Zoom reconsiders. Yep, I hope they do too, because again, most likely this is just a business decision. They want to, they're looking at the market and they're saying, hey, people want to have encrypted video communications and encrypted communications in general. And so would they be willing to pay for that? And you know what, if Zoom said that they wanted to do that, again, they're a private business, they can do what they want. But for them to have this call where they use that decision to throw shade on the idea of anyone being able to use encrypted communications as somehow promoting child abuse is not only wrong, but it's just freaking annoying because that's not based on any evidence that they presented it's just fear-mongering and most likely what happened is that they got some very concerned calls from the so-called safety experts at whatever u.s government department makes these kinds of phone calls and they were told, hey, you're a very popular video conferencing thing. If you enable encrypted communications for, you know, such a broad customer base, people might actually get accustomed to having privacy. And we can't have that. Yeah, this is clearly. Yeah, the, I, I don't buy this entire argument. I mean, this to me is just a, pi a pivot to try and deal with the major backlash with how Swiss cheese like their security was while still maintaining the ability to surveil as large a portion of their user base as possible. Like that, yeah. that right there in my mind, I am not just in my mind right now, them being tied to the communist party of China is not just a speculation anymore. I mean, the response I would have to this if I actually could respond to them, which I don't because I don't use them, uh, my response would be, well, don't you think it was a greater contributor to child abuse, the fact that you were allowing schools to onboard massive numbers of children onto a video conferencing platform that didn't even use proper authentic authentication mechanisms for people to join calls and resulted in weirdos oh, yeah. jumping in to to just show themselves off to a bunch of kids and then run away like yeah. it seems it seems like your solution would actually involve more encryption and better access control here and being able to control content between people who are communicating mhm mm and yeah, I there were a very large number of those incidences when the lockdown first started. But yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I I will never use Zoom again. And honestly, uh, I'm gonna probably start shitting on people who still use it 
even though I have a, a lot of people I respect in this space, I know still do, um, and friends of mine, I, I'm going to start shitting on all of them. Yeah, basically the only context in which I would be willing to use Zoom and have used Zoom is where I know for a fact that whatever is being said in that meeting is going to be public anyway and shared with everyone. And so whether I say something that is sensitive is, you know, entirely said under the knowledge that other people are going to see it. And I have no expectation of privacy whatsoever. I don't even want to support them in that context, even though it's airtight from an OPSEC point of view, like fuck that company. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to use it either, but it seems like every podcaster, even in this space, uses Zoom for everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. All right. You want to put the cherry on top for today's episode? Uh, well, to make it short and sweet, um, everyone knows that fake Toshi is uh, embroiled in a whole bunch of different legal cases in different jurisdictions, and one of those has come to a close. Um, basically, the judge that was, or, well, the Lord Justice, as they are called, uh, has decided in a recent decision that basically the lawsuit between fake Toshi and Roger Ver doesn't make sense, and so it is over. Um, after listing a number of reasons for why England and Wales is not the appropriate jurisdiction, uh, Lord Justice um, Pompwell, Pop, 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 Popwell, uh, and Lord Justice Flax said, uh, for the detailed reasons set out above and in agreement with the judge, I find that England and Wales is not is clear is not clearly the most appropriate place to bring this action for defamation. I would therefore dismiss the appeal. And that's about it. Ha ha Oh man. There was also a uh, slight update on the case, um, the Kleiman case, I believe where, um, well, there was a very embarrassing episode in the last week or two regarding uh, certain Bitcoin addresses shown to not actually belong to Fake Toshi, as Fake Toshi claimed. Um, And apparently he has decided, according to Stefan Pally, to file a motion asking the court to keep his list of Bitcoin addresses secret because if people see them, they will be able to provide further evidence that he is full of crap. Obviously, that is a quote from Stefan Pally, but it is probably accurate based on uh, a summary of what is written in the court documents. Um, So, yes, uh, fake Toshi has been caught out and now uh, he wants to hide the evidence as... As far as I can see. Ah, boy. (laughs) That's seriously, like, going to be the most hilarious comedy movie in five years ever made. And nobody's going to watch it except people who were in Bitcoin, like, five years ago. (laughs) Alrighty. Well, I guess uh, that's a wrap for the day. Uh... Got a final thought for us, Janine? Uh, So there hasn't been much to update about the Assange case in a while, but today there was a brief hearing regarding how to schedule the upcoming extradition trial in the UK. And uh, basically it never goes well, and it's hard to even tell what was said because... With the lockdown going on, a lot of media and journalists who want to participate in the very limited way that they can, which is to um, tune into, you know, audio recordings over or audio live stream over the Internet, uh, are not really able to hear what is going on at all, because apparently this courtroom has not figured out how to do that in any capacity. Um, But what we do know, uh, according to at least one person who's been covering 
uh, these hearings is that today the court received an email from HMP Balnar saying that Assange is refusing to attend and refusing to sign the refusal form that he is refusing to attend. Um, his barrister, Edward Fitzgerald, says that Assange is too unwell and has had respiratory problems for some time. Now, there is no no further detail on that. There is no uh, direct claim that that those respiratory problems have to do with COVID-19, and they may very well have nothing to do with COVID-19 um, because he has had ongoing health issues for a very long time. But nonetheless, um, given the fact that COVID-19 is still out there and could very well be circulating in the prison, it is definitely not a good situation that someone who is experiencing respiratory problems is in that environment because it makes them more prone to catching it. So hopefully at some point in the next couple of months, um, the judge is finally going to realize as, I, as many people have argued, that it does not make sense to keep him in a high security prison when he has not only committed no, he's not even accused of committing any violent crimes, um, he has no history of violence, and literally there is very little possibility of him being able to go anywhere uh, in terms of absconding because lockdowns and also health problems so the idea that he needs to be kept in there while he's waiting while we're uncertain about whether the lockdown will even uh uh lessen to the point where a trial would even make sense and be able to accommodate people who need to be there uh it just it makes no sense he should be let out um under house arrest at the very least Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess all I really want to say is just reiterate what I said at the beginning of the show. Like, now is the most important time in your life to look at something and verify it before you start amplifying or circulating information that could be entirely false and put out there purely for the purposes of inciting more anger and antagonizing this situation. And I want to say to anybody out there who winds up in a position where they have to defend themselves or their property with force, the key word is defend yourself. That is what you should be doing and that alone and not looking for any opportunity or any reason to do anything else. Everybody out there, be safe. And we'll catch you later, punks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>